this movie may have the best backstory of any film in the festival. So can you start, let's just start with the backstory. It started with a want ad. I'm really interested in the, the where and the when and the who and the why for the backstory. Yeah, uh, you know, it started with this classified ad that was published in 1997 in Backwoods Home Magazine, which is a survivalist publication uh, to help you prepare for the coming Armageddon. So if you need to can your own venison or, or anything like that, uh, they'll tell you how to do it. And uh, the ad then took on a life of its own on the Internet, and people paired it with uh, a photo of, of a man with a, with a pretty long mullet uh, and a song called Push It to the Limit. And uh, at that point, uh, Derek Connolly, the writer, saw the ad uh, on the internet, and behind those six sentences, uh, he felt that there was a, a longer, more detailed story to be told. And so, and so, recap what the want ad said. It wasn't just your standard. Here's how you're going to survive Armageddon. It, right. it involved yeah, time it's travel. A, it's right. Time travel. It, it said, "Wanted someone to travel back in time with me. This is not a joke. You'll get paid when we get back." You must bring your own weapons. Safety's not guaranteed. I've only done this once before. And almost all of that, that ends up in your in the movie version, right? That yes. one ad with an with an address. And where was where where, where was this? Uh, how were they supposed to get in contact with him in the original story? How were they supposed to contact him? In the original ad, there was a P.O. box out of California, which we okay. changed to Washington because that's where we set the film. And uh, for many years, a lot of people would go and stake out that P.O. box, hoping to find the real time traveler. And there really was a, a mini cult of, of, uh, of followers who really believed this was a real guy. Yeah. And he really had a time machine, and, and they wanted to go with him wherever he was going. And I didn't know this until I read the notes, long after I'd seen your film, that you actually tracked down the guy who placed the original ad. And what did he tell you about what he had done and why? Uh, I did track him down. Uh, we had lunch together in New Hampshire, uh, and he brought his own weapon, as, as he often does. <laughs> and what was it? True story. Uh, I, you know, I don't know guns very well. It was okay. small. It was in the small of his back, but it, you know, I knew that he could reach it in the in the event that that restaurant was was invaded or. So whatever. it was a gun, though. It wasn't a bow and arrow. No, no. no he's, <laughs> okay. He's, he's he's a handgun guy. Yeah. Uh, and his name is John Silvera. And he does live in, in Oregon, where uh, Backwoods Home Magazine is based. Uh, and I, I do recommend the magazine. It's actually, you know, in the event, you know, if you're a married guy or, or you feel like you want to be more helpful around the house, especially in the event of apocalypse, that magazine is going to going to teach you a lot. Um, so so John uh, was very supportive of the film, and and we we actually uh, you know we optioned that classified ad and uh, like we would a piece of literature. Uh, so we you know I think it's maybe the shortest. <laughs> literary option in, in history, um, but you know we felt there was a, there was a story in it. Even though we we, we take off from there and, and build a whole world, we we wanted to honor. Yeah, that. and that's what was that's so great. I mean, he meant it as a joke, right? He says he he'd done a I saw a featurette on the making of the film, and they said that he he had put one ad in. I don't know if he was looking for a mate or something, but then he also put this in, this in as sort of a joke. What the brilliance of your conceit for the movie, or the screenwriters, or both of you together, was that you have this guy who's earnest as hell about this endeavor. So I'm interested in now, let's get into what you're really interested in and what really works for an audience is your fictional take. This is a made up version, it's not based, it's not a documentary about this particular guy. And what your particular take is on this want ad, the kind of guy who would do it, and where you go with it. So just talk about your take on the reality that we've now just been hearing about. Well, you know, what we saw it was a guy who was uh, very earnest and very sincere and uh, didn't really like uh, that he was being made fun of. And, uh, you know, I think that it's a, it's a very universal want to, to be able to go back and, and fix some mistakes that you've made in the past. And, and I think that there was a, uh, the cer a certain longing behind those words, which are very funny on the surface. Uh, we felt like there was a guy there who, uh, who you know, wanted a do-over to a certain extent. And uh, so, you know, we created a character that, first of all, you know, Aubrey Plaza could fall in love with, and we would believe it, uh, <laughs> but also who, you know, he, he carries his own weapons. He has a shotgun, and, you know, he's going to, in the event that they, you know, come in contact with some dinosaurs or or somewhere in the Civil War, you know, they need a gun, he's going he's gonna to be prepared. In most circles, this guy, the star of your movie, is a nut job. You don't treat him that way. Why not? Uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe I, I feel like all 
you know, even crazy people deserve to be loved. And I even crazy people deserve to be respected. And I think we're all a little crazy. Uh-huh. And I, that's in a lot of ways, that's kind of the message of the movie is, look, like, we're all kind of crazy. So, you know, find your crazy person and, and march through time with them. Very good. Now, are you comfortable with this being, uh, you know, the, the genre romantic comedy slapped on it? Are you comfortable with the genre? I, I worry that romantic comedy suggests something that the movie really isn't. Okay. Uh, so I don't want, uh, you know, the, the question of the film is not, are these two going to get together, which is the question of a, of a romantic comedy. The question of the film is, is this guy insane and does he have a time machine? Ah. And so, yes, it's very romantic and yes, people fall in love, but there's a whole other story going on with Jake Johnson's character, uh, which is really more of, a, of an emotional time travel story and, and a, a, a metaphorical one instead of a literal one. And, and I think we do a lot of things in this movie. It's it's a lot. Uh, it's it's you know it's kind of hard edged. It's it's not a soft movie all the way through. And I think that finding a balance between you know the the warmer, more romantic scenes and then the edgier stuff uh, allows it to I think appeal to more people than maybe just you know the straight up romantic comedy date movie. Am I going to get the guy? Or yeah. Not, you know. So we uh, there are a number of issues I want to talk about. One is in any kind of movie that you make it a lot depends on casting and you've got two your, your, the uh, the the romantic leads I guess you'd say Mark Duplass first of all he is sort of like an indie god it seems like I mean he's actually in two of the best movies of the film festival right now your sister's sister he uh, and then uh, safety not guaranteed he also has he has this I mean he practically invented mumblecore I'm not sure he'd want to take credit for that but I mean he is he's sort of like this this god in this certain small indie world I suspect how did you get him? How badly did you want him? And how crucial was he for the success of your movie? Uh, he was very crucial. You know, I like to I, I like to say that you know if you've only seen one Mark Duplass movie this year, you probably don't go to the movies very often. <laughs> right. And I think that uh, that there's a reason for that. And and he uh, he was really important to us in from the producerial standpoint. He came in as an executive producer and he was he was instrumental in getting the movie made. Yeah. And once we realize okay they're gonna they're gonna let us do this, uh, in searching for Kenneth and talking about what we wanted him to be, both Mark and I just as creatives, really, and Derek as well, we wanted him to be real, to be honest, to be a, an actual human being and we you know, we just sort of realized that we had the guy right here. And uh, you know one of the great things about independent filmmaking especially at, at this budget level, is you can actually choose the actors that are best for the roles. You don't have to mm. think about, you know, who's most famous in, in Romania and, and all these other, <laughs> right. all these other uh, issues. So, you know, and I think that's a, that's a privilege that I don't know if I'm ever going to have it uh-huh. to a certain extent. And, and so I, I, I pick, you know, the people that I thought would be able to embody these characters uh, in a really uh, indelible way. And as good as Mark is, I really think the heart and soul of your movie is Aubrey Plaza. I mean, she is a real... Now, I know she's been around Parks and Recreation. She's done other movies, Funny People. But this this is a great role for her. And she just... She, that It's a tricky role, but I just think she is so good in this. Did you know that going in? Um, were you Was her performance a revelation? And talk about why she was perfect for this movie. Well, the movie was written for her. It was. Uh, it was ah. constructed from the ground up Perfect. for her, and and we, you know, the initial, the, the first version of the character, it really changed over the course of time that, that Derek and I worked on it, and as she became, uh, as she became richer and more emotional, I never doubted for a second that Aubrey could do it, and, and you know, Aubrey is, you know, despite what she seems, is actually a real human being with feelings, <laughs> and uh, and she, uh, you know, I know, having met her, I, I knew that, and, and I felt like. The best possible way to to have a character that's going to grow and change as much as that character does is to be able to almost use the, the preconceived notions that people have of the actor. Hmm. Uh, and you know, you come into that movie feeling like you know Aubrey Plaza, right. and we slowly I mean, deconstruct that over the yeah. course. And and uh, you know, I, I knew she could get there just because I, I think that you know, first of all, she is an actor, yeah. and that we would have the at least in the most crucial moments we would have the, the time to like let her breathe and, and find it and, and I think that everybody has something in their past that they wish that they could change and do differently it's a very universal thing and, and so for an actor to be able to pull from that and think of oh well, here's my way that I could be a better version of, of me and, and it, she really got there and, and I was I'm impressed <laughs>